right, let's get to work, you guys. Uh, do you have your Bibles with you? I hope you brought them with you. If you do, open them up to Matthew chapter 12. Uh, if you, you don't have a Bible with you, you can open a phone or a tablet. Or there are hardback black Bibles under every single chair. Uh, if you're online, you can click that Bible tab, Matthew 12. Matthew 12, we'd love for you to see this uh, uh, with, your, with your own eyes. Get it in your hands. So Matthew chapter 12 is where we're going to be. Uh, if you've been with us at, for any amount of time at Fathom, uh, I'm sure I've told you, you've heard this at some point, that I wasn't raised in the church. Okay, you know, I did not go, grow up going to VBS and kind of doing church stuff. For, for, for my family, Sunday was just another day of the weekend. It was just the second day of the weekend, and by 5 p.m., I started dreading the fact that Monday was coming. I had to go to school, right? That was Sundays for me growing up. Um, but on my block that I grew up on, there was another family, uh, and these guys were uh, pretty conservative Christians. Uh, there were kids in their family, and I can remember going over to their house on Sunday mornings uh, and, or Sunday afternoons to see if the kids uh, w- w- would be able to come out and play. And so I'd knock on the door, and their, get, their mom would open up the door, and I'd say, hey, can they come out and play? And, and, and I remember mama saying, no, they cannot come out and play. Today's the Sabbath. And they'd shut the door. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't even know what was going on, okay? Now, I didn't know what the word Sabbath meant at that time, but I learned from those kids on the other days when they were allowed to come outside that on Sundays, the Sabbath, they weren't allowed to do all the things that they normally did on other days. So they weren't allowed to watch TV or play Nintendo, like original Nintendo, right? Two buttons, mashing that thing. Like, they weren't allowed to do that on the Sabbath, okay? Uh, they went to church, uh, it seemed like all day, but I, it was certainly all morning. They were at church a lot on Sundays, and then they would come home and be at home having what they called family time. Just fa- fam- family time. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what the difference was between regular time and family time. Like, maybe during family time, they just kind of sat around and talked or sat around and stared at the walls, or I, I mean, I just didn't understand it. Something was going on during family time that I was not a part of, but, but here's where my child Chris brain went. The Sabbath was the day that you couldn't do anything fun. That's just kind of what, what my mind told me. It's like, okay, uh, hey, can I go over to Billy's house to play? No, it's a Sabbath. Today is the Sabbath. There's no fun on the Sabbath. You will sit here and you will think holy thoughts, right? Today is the day that the Lord has made. You will rejoice and be glad in it. It's just Sabbath, right? Like it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense to my worldview. I'm calling today's sermon closed on Sundays. Closed on Sundays, okay? Think Chick-fil-A, Hobby Lobby, or Kanye West, whatever generation you're in, like closed on Sundays. You see, uh, what I'm talking about is I I think there's a popularized version in our world of this idea of Sabbath, um, and then there's the Bible, and what the biblical idea of Sabbath is very different than that. And so if, you've, if you were with us last fall, we were in a sermon series called The Disciplines. And we talked about the spiritual discipline of practicing and observing uh, the Sabbath. But, but today, what we see in our text, I, I kind of want to, that was more practical. Today, I want to take more of a theological approach as to what is the Sabbath. As biblical Christians, are we supposed to be closed on Sundays? Like, what does this mean for us? So, so we are in the middle of our study of the gospel of Matthew. We are at Matthew chapter 12. And here's what's happening in the middle of the gospel of Matthew. Opposition is on the rise. Opposition is rising and mounting against Jesus. And in chapter 12, we find that opposition coming at him from a group called the Pharisees. Now, if you've been in church any time at all, you've heard about the Pharisees, but the Pharisees were uh, a branch, a sect of Jews, of Judaism, with a very high, high view of the law the law of God. They put high and great stress on strictly obeying the law down to even the very smallest and minute of details. But which hear me, that's a great thing. Following God's laws, doing the things that God has commanded us to do, that is a very good thing. That's the Pharisees. And in our text today, we find Jesus at odds with the Pharisees over one of their favorite things to battle about, which is the Sabbath. The Pharisees and Jesus, they love to go at it over the Sabbath because in the Jewish law, the Sabbath was a day, one day out of seven, set aside for rest and worship. 
That's the idea, okay? Uh, If you know the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, uh, this one's number four. Top 50%, okay? Makes the cut. This is an important law. Actually, the idea of Sabbath is rooted all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. When, when God finishes creating all things, he finishes his work in creation. And it says that on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. God rested and he blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. And so God's people too, just like God rested, God's people are now to rest from their work on the seventh day. That's the Sabbath. God's people are enter his rest, God's rest to remember the Sabbath and to make it Holy. Now, the problem is that the Old Testament talks a lot about Sabbath, um, but uh, it only stipulates that it's to be set apart as a day of rest from your work and for worship. There's not a lot of details on what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath in the Old Testament. There's just not a lot there. And the Jewish people needed some directions. They needed some help on what constitutes work and what constitutes rest. So the rabbis over history had developed 39 Sabbath rules. There were 30, you can Google this. You can Google the 39 Sabbath rules in in Judaism on what could and could not be done for Sabbath, okay? And and the Pharisees, the Pharisees who are now at odds with Jesus, they are ardent and and, and fervent on trying to keep these 32 laws to the letter. Okay, so they, they, they want to keep the fourth commandment. Good thing. So they created these 39 laws, which could maybe be a good thing, could be a bad thing on observing to keep the Sabbath. They're trying to obey God's laws, but now they've gotten to the point where they are missing the very heart of God's Sabbath command. They're missing the heart of it because they're so busy trying to get 39 things taken care of on the Sabbath that they're missing the very rest that God institutes in the Sabbath. You see this irony here, right? It becomes ironic that they work really, 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 really hard at not working. That's what's happened. So let's see what Jesus has to say, what our text has to say in Matthew chapter 12 about whether or not we should be closed on Sundays. Here we go. Matthew 12, starting in verse one. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, Your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Okay. Let's set the scene. Unlike today, where roads go around properties, in in the ancient Near East, roads would go straight through individual farms and fields. Okay. And so there was always some sort of growth of whatever they were harvesting, in this case, grain uh, coming up over the sides uh, all the way to the edge of the roads. And so Leviticus chapter 19 permits travelers to pick grain and eat if they were hungry. It wasn't considered stealing. In fact, there were, there were in Leviticus 19, it said, don't go to the very edges. Don't glean to the very edges of your field. Leave some of that for the sojourner, for the traveler, so that they can eat if they get hungry on the road. And so this is what Jesus and his disciples are doing. They are being lawful in eating grain that's growing up over on this road. But this is the Sabbath. This is the Sabbath, okay? And, and these 39 complex Sabbath laws are in place. And the Pharisees see what his disciples are doing. They're plucking these grains and eating them, and they accuse them of breaking the Sabbath laws. And I, as I studied, uh, most commentators think they are accusing them of breaking up to four of those 39 laws. Here they are, okay? Number one, the plucking of the grain could be considered reaping, which was forbidden. Rubbing the grain to separate the husks from the grain could be considered threshing. Forbidden, okay? Um, Blowing away the husks or like letting them float away uh, or whatever, that was considered winnowing. (laughs) Forbidden. And if, if that wasn't enough for good measure, they may have seen the entire exercise as preparation of food. 
Okay, which, by the way, Orthodox Jews still practice to this day. They prepare all of their food for Sabbath ahead of time. And they even have, like, I mean, you've seen this maybe, special timers on ovens for Sabbath setting. So they don't even have to start their oven for fear that that might constitute preparing food on the Sabbath. I mean, this is all to keep the law. That's what they're doing here. And that's what they're accusing Jesus' disciples of. The Pharisees are questioning, hey, why aren't your disciples following the law. Why aren't they keeping the law? Why aren't they keeping the Sabbath? Well, Jesus will respond in verse three. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Verse five, or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? So Jesus does a little work here, biblical work, does a little Bible study with these Pharisees, the experts in the Bible. And he says this twice. He says, have you not read? Have you not read? Like he just, I mean, that's, that's a jab at these Bible scholars. Have you not read? And he, and he points out their ignorance towards the very scriptures that they're trying to adhere to. And here's, he, he points out some inconsistencies in their argument. He uses two illustrations, he, little examples here of their ignorance. First, he reminds them of David. David in, in, in 1 Samuel 21 is a story where he and his men are hungry. They're on the run from Saul. They are hungry. They enter into the tabernacle, into the tent of meeting, and they eat the consecrated bread, the show bread, the bread of presence that was reserved only for the priests, the Levitical priests, to eat. So, so David is officially in violation of the law. And yet Jesus points out that no one condemns David for this breach of the law. And he says, essentially, if David and his men could break the Torah for the sake of, of their hunger, how much more can Jesus and his disciples? He's pointing out their inconsistencies. Okay, the second illustration he uses is he, he brings up the priests themselves. And he says, hey, the priests, the, the, they are engaging in temple duties on the Sabbath. They are working on the Sabbath. They officially, too, are guilty of Sabbath violations. Yet the rabbis considered that temple service an exception to the rule. It's kind of like the staff here, the paid staff at Fathom Church, right? Like right now, I'm working, by the way. This is my job. You're paying me right now. Whether you think it's worth it or not, you're paying me right now. I ain't closed on Sundays, right? We are open for business. This is why I can't Sabbath on a Sunday. I've got a Sabbath on a different day for me. But the priests here, that's what he's saying. The priests are doing God's work on the Sabbath. And he says that they are guiltless, even though they technically, and he uses the word, they technically profane the Sabbath. If you know anything about Old Testament priesting, it's busy work. It's a lot of work. And so Jesus is using these examples to say, there's some flaws in your thinking here. If you're trying to follow all these laws to, to the letter of the law, what about the rest of these stories where people didn't do that? You're missing the point. And then he takes it to the next level. He amps it up a little bit in verse six. He says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. Them's fighting words right there. To a Jewish Pharisee, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. This is Jesus amping this up. This is Jesus taking this to the nth degree. Okay, he just said to these Pharisees, that he, I, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. It's, it's no wonder that in verse 14, they want to kill him. He just said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, as in, I get to interpret the law. I get to interpret the law. I am greater than the temple. I am greater than the priests. I am greater than David and his merry band of men. And I am greater than these very laws the law that Moses gave you, the law itself, I am greater than these things, and they flip out. 
It's my first point this morning on what it means to be closed on Sunday. The Sabbath is about mercy, not legalism. The Sabbath is about mercy, not legalism. The, the Pharisees have come to believe that the stricted, strictest adherence to the Sabbath laws is exactly what is necessary to keep those laws. And in doing so, they missed what the Sabbath was all about. They missed the whole purpose of that law. See, the Sabbath law wasn't meant to become this burden. It wasn't meant to become this weight that they had to carry, robbing them of joy. No, it wasn't supposed to be this set of rules that it, you had to kind of legalistically follow to the, to the T, even to the point where if you got hungry and you hadn't prepared food, that it was violation of God's law if you went and whipped something up to eat. That's not ever what this was meant to be. See, when we treat the law like this, like legalistic rules to be followed, we miss the whole point. The law, when used legalistically, robs us of joy. It robs us of joy because the law was actually meant to be like a set of guide rails, like a set of, a set of things to protect you from going outside the bounds and to keep you in the lane that you're supposed to be, this, this lane living the way that will bring you the most joy. It's not to rob you from joy, it's to bring you the most joy. See, we misconstrue the law when we think about it as robbing us, as trying to keep us away from some sort of fun and life and joy that we think is out there, but the law of God is meant to kind of hamper us from that. That's not it at all. It's not about robbing us, it's actually about freeing us. I've used this illustration historically before on when, I, when I talk about the law. Let me, let me explain this again. When my daughter was first born, when she was first born uh, in the hospital, the nurses in the hospital taught me something that dramatically affected the first six months of her life and my life. The nurse taught me how to swaddle, how to swaddle my daughter. Now, if you have kids, uh, you likely know the swaddle method, okay? Uh, this is where I would wrap her as tight as I possibly could in a blanket. That's called swaddling, okay, is wrapping them up. Uh, like I would bind her arms to her side and I would get her good and wrapped, kind of like a little chipotle, human chipotle burrito, just wrap her in there, get all that stuff shoved in there. And I guess it's to simulate the womb, or something weird like that, but that's essentially the swaddle. And, and hear me, if I did not swaddle her, she would fall asleep, okay? But then in the middle of her sleep, she would most likely twitch or fidget or move or something and punch herself in the face. This happened, okay? She would just, she'd have an arm and she'd hit herself in the head and she'd wake up and then she would start screaming, and then I would wake up and nobody was happy at that moment, okay? It was, it was awful. So I would swaddle her. This is how I do it. I'd lay her down. And swaddling sounds cozy. Like that word sounds like comfortable and cozy. It's, it's really kind of violent, okay? Because she didn't like it. And so I'd lay the blanket down. I'd lay Harper down. I'd put a hand on her chest. And with my thumb, I'd hold her arm down. And then I'd ratchet one of these over and, and hold her down, pin the other arm. And then get, I mean, it's like you're getting a ratchet strap going on that thing. It's like a straight jacket for infants. That's what it is, okay? That's exactly what it is. And she would fight me the whole time. And so then I'd get her all swaddled, officially bound together with this blanket. And she didn't like it. She didn't like that restriction. So once I had her swaddled, I'd have to pick her up in my arms and rock her. And here's what would always happen. It would take about five minutes, okay? I would rock her and she'd be fighting me and fussing and fighting and struggling. And then she would relax and her eyes would go about half mast. And then like she would realize that she was swaddled. Like she would, it would she'd come to her senses and she'd start freaking out again and she'd start fighting again and wrestling me and, and screaming sometimes. And then, she, you know, after about 30 seconds of that, she would go limp again and her eyes would like flutter to like 10%, just like kind of starting to roll up into the back of her head. I'd be like, oh, she's almost there. And listen, the rookie move is you put her down then. Don't put her down then, okay? I learned this the hard way. There's still one more fight left in her. So the third fight comes, she fights me one more time. I'm rocking her, she's swaddled in, she's struggling hard to break free of this bondage that her evil father has put her in. 
And then finally, when that fight is exhausted out of her, her eyes will go all the way closed and she will slink into the deep sleep that I needed her to be in. Then I would carefully lay her in her crib and walk away silently. Don't wake the baby, right? Like that's exactly how it worked. It's the best image I know of how, best image I know of how the Sabbath law is meant to be for us. You've got this law of the Sabbath and it's meant to be a swaddle to bring you rest. And and sometimes when we feel like we're being restricted, we respond with, no, 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 no. Like, I don't like this. This doesn't feel like freedom. It doesn't feel like freedom to be closed on Sundays. This feels like bondage. God, this feels like restriction. This feels like it's not for my good. It's actually robbing me of joy. But hear me, only when submitted... Only when swaddled in will you find the rest that you so desperately need. It's the freedom that you truly desire, but it only comes in submitting to that restriction. But being closed on Sundays, listen, it's, it's about mercy. It's for your joy. It's not this legalistic thing that's meant to bind you and keep you away from joy. It's about mercy, not legalism. Okay. Let's keep going. Matthew 12. There's another bit to this. Verse nine. Jesus went on from there. We think this is about a week later. Okay. He, he went on from there and he entered their synagogue. There being the Pharisees, by the way. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? Okay few things to note here. We're a week later, and it's very interesting that the text says that he entered their synagogue. Did you see that? He enters their synagogue. This is the Pharisees' synagogue. This is their home turf, okay? And again, they see Jesus, and they start questioning him about the Sabbath. Now, now there's this man with a hand that's shriveled up. He's got a disability in his hand. And back to those 39 Sabbath rules, the law was specific. The law was very specific. You could heal on the Sabbath only if it was a life-threatening situation. But if it was not a life-threatening situation, you should wait until the next day. That's what the Sabbath laws prescribed. So this man with a withered hand, he is not in a life-threatening moment. And so they're ready to test Jesus on this, right? Did you see that? Those last few words in verse 10, so that they might accuse him. That's the intent. Now follow me here, okay? We're in their synagogue. and, And there's a disabled man in their synagogue. And so what do the Pharisees do? Do they, you know, help this man in their synagogue? No, do they, do they get a medical care or provide for his needs? Do they try and comfort him in any way or even pray over him, maybe for healing? No. They see Jesus come into their church and they see this suffering man in their church and they decide to use this man from their church as a trap for Jesus so they might accuse him. They don't care about lawfulness. They don't care about the Sabbath. They certainly don't care about this guy or his hand. They just demonstrated that. They only care about trying to trick and expose and ultimately, as we see in verse 14, kill the Lord of the Sabbath. He has so offended them that they would use someone from their very community. Well, let's see what happens. Verse 11. Jesus said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into the pit on a Sabbath, will not take a hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out. And it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. 
Jesus, this might be one of the strongest rebukes that he gives to the Pharisees in my reading of the scriptures. It feels scathing to me, his rebuke. Essentially, here's how I think he's saying it. Hear hear it in my voice, and, and maybe you'll see this in the text, but essentially he's saying this. What sort of people are you? Who do you think you are? Like that you would use and abuse and neglect a suffering member in your synagogue. Who are you? Who dares do something like this? This here, I, 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 this is an angry Jesus moment. And Jesus, he, he just, he, he sees it. I think he's disgusted with it. And he just heals the man. Just outright heals the man. Again, proving his authority. Not just with word, not just saying, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. No, he's showing it. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Stretch out that hand. And it's better. And then he makes it clear. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now, I, I don't think there are many of us in here online today who are, who are trying to trap Jesus by using people exactly like this. I don't know that there's a one-to-one kind of correlation here, but I, I do think that there's a point here for us, okay? Uh, and, and it's my second point about, about being closed on Sundays. The Sabbath is about mercy, not legalism. We already said that, but the Sabbath is also about love, not laziness. And let me explain how I think this actually counterpoints what Jesus is doing here. The Sabbath is a day about doing good. That's what he says, It's a day about doing good. It's a day about loving others. Jesus makes it clear that the rules about keeping the Sabbath were never meant to restrict us from working to love and serve others. If we were to ignore the needs of others, we would not be fulfilling the Sabbath. If your rest prohibits you from loving others, it ain't biblical rest. Sabbath rest is about doing good. It's about caring for others. It's about loving God's people and serving. Now, here's how it plays out, I think, today. I have heard recently this pushback to, to people coming to church, right? Like coming to church and serving in church uh, because on Sunday, they'll say things like, well, it's my Sabbath. I can't be serving on my Sabbath. It's our family day. Like, I can't be coming to church. You know, that's, we need family time. Can't be, can't be serving people because that's, that's our Sabbath. That's my rest, and, and I can't work on the Sabbath. And listen, yes, we all need breaks, okay? I'm not, I, I hear me, not talking about vacations, not talking about resting, not taking adequate breaks from serving, and, and I'm, I'm not saying any of that. But lest we miss something here, Doing good for those in our church on the Sabbath is a good and right part of practicing and remembering the Sabbath. It's part of the rest that God offers us. Hear me. We cannot say that we observe the Sabbath if we neglect God's people. I don't care how many of those 39 things you do. I don't care how much you shut off your phone and your email and your Instagram. I don't care how much you do uh, nothing on the Sabbath. If you neglect God's people, you are missing what observing the Sabbath is. So let me get on my soapbox for a minute. If you thought I wasn't on it, here I am, okay? Just for a minute, okay? Gathering with your church is a vital part of keeping the Sabbath. Gathering with God's people is a vital part of keeping the Sabbath. It's not that your faith does not matter the rest of the week, okay? It's not that at all. All I'm saying is something special, something unique, and something life-giving happens when we all come together on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. I've heard it put like this, okay? Uh, It's true that a person does not have to go to church to be a Christian, But it's also true that one does not have to go home to be married. But in both cases, if they do not, they will have a very poor relationship. I think that's a fair illustration. 
in comparison. See, gathering together with God's people on Sundays, it's not a, a command per se. Like, I can't just like open up the text to the go to church on Sunday verse. There's, that verse doesn't really exist, but it was a very natural outcome of the movement of Jesus. It always has been. And giving up on, on doing the very good to those in their midst, in our midst, is, is what's happening here because of some strange Sabbath law. Or what I'll just say for us is just kind of laziness. It's like Christian laziness. It's certainly not how we enter the rest that God intends for us. So this isn't just unique to us, okay? This whole like, I don't really feel like I need to go to church. I don't feel like I need to serve God's people. I don't feel like I need to do this stuff. Like, this is not new to us. In the New Testament, we find that even the first century church, people at times gave up meeting together. Now, sometimes that was because of persecution, but other times it's just because they gave up on it, right? And that encourages me this week. As your pastor, it encourages me that people 2,000 years ago weren't going to church, all right? It's just good for my heart to know that. Right? They're like, oh, who's preaching on Sunday? The Apostle Paul? <laughs> we heard him last week. I'll come back when Peter's up next. You know, like that's, 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 that's just encouraging to my heart. Your pastor is encouraged by that. But, but this is true for us today, church. Listen, th- there are some of you who won't be here next Sunday. And again, I'm not talking about vacation, right? Like there are some of you who won't be here next week because you're here today. I know that's none of you. Okay, that's none of us here, right? But like, there are some people out there somewhere who decide every week whether or not they're going to go to church. They decide whether or not it's worth it. And again, if you're out of town, it's different. But if you are in town and you're in this, like, I got to decide whether I go to church. I mean, there's something missing here. Jesus has just said that doing good to the people in their community, in the very midst of their gathering, their synagogue, their church is a part of Sabbath keeping. Therefore, the Sabbath is about love, not laziness. And, and hear me, as a pastor for, for, you know, 15 years now, let me just say this. If you're going to persevere in your faith, you need to stay close to God's people. If you are going to persevere in your faith, you need to stay close and serve God's people. Robert Murray McShane, who's a 19th century Scottish preacher, he said this, I love this quote, unfathomable oceans of grace are in Christ for you. Dive and dive again. You will never come to the bottom of these depths. He's saying this in the context of of Christian church community. Dive and dive again to the depths that Christ has for you. So so we say all the time, our vision vision statement here at Fathom is that we want to see all people go deeper with God. So we say that all the time and we preach that all the time. And people will often come to me and say, hey, how do I go deeper? Like, how do I go deeper? And it's funny because I, I... I think 10 years ago, I would have answered the question differently than I do today. Because 10 years ago, I would have said, coming on Sundays is not enough. You got to do more. You got to be connected. You got to do all this. Like just coming on Sundays and attending a church service is not enough. And that's how I would have answered 10 years ago. But today, I always want to start with this. You just got to show up. Did you know that in, in, in the world right now, the average Christian attends church 1.3 times a month? I don't know how they figured that point three out. Maybe it's online attendance, online people, you know, but like, I don't know how that really works. But, but, but all I'm saying is you've got to show up. That's the, the first step. That's the first step to going deeper. I mean, this is a family. You've got to show up if, if, if you want to be a part of this. It's going to be impossible to stay connected to the family if you never show up for dinner. It's impossible. And I, and I just meet so many people who've spent their whole lives going from church to church to church to church, and they just never stop and go deep at one place and dig deep. This is like the guy who, uh, who dates 20 girls and thinks that he's a great lover. He ain't the great lover. He's a great loser. That's what he is, right? 20, like, I mean, that's just like getting to level one on a video game 20 times. You aren't good at that game. That's different than getting to level 20 once, right? 
That's like being a perennial white belt in karate. You're not a master of karate. You ain't no ninja if you got a white belt. They give them to you first day. (laughs) How long have you guys been married? You told me this last week. 40 years. They're great lovers right there. They celebrated like two Sundays ago, right? And you didn't show up to church. (laughs) All right. (laughs) We'll talk about that later. (laughs) Guys, love is about going deep. Love is about going deep. And some of you want your faith to go deep. You want your faith to go deep, but you're only willing to date or maybe just flirt, fool around a little bit. Another thing I hear very often, you may have heard this as well. Well, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm a Christian, but I'm giving up on this whole church thing. I'm giving up on the church. I love Jesus. I just don't love the church. You ever say that? I've said that. You ever heard somebody say that? Come on. I mean, we can be honest here. I know it's church, no place to be honest, but you can be honest about it, okay? I just want to say to that, to that, I love Jesus, but not the church. I just want to say this. Like, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? Because, Because what you're saying is that you're giving up on God's people, right? The church is in this building, Right? We've talked about this. It's not this weird low ceiling building. The church is in this room. The church is in these chairs or even this service. Like when you leave today, this room will still be here, but the church will have left. The church will have left the building. The church, and I'm not saying anything you don't know. The church is us together. You aren't the church by yourself. You go to the bar tomorrow and you start chatting with somebody about Jesus. You are not the church there. I promise you. The church is when we gather together. We are the church when we gather. So when you say that you're giving up on the church, you're saying, I'm giving up on you guys. I'm giving up, you're giving up on us. And how in the world can you give up on us when Jesus won't give up on us? Jesus died for the church, the bride that was unfaithful to him. He never gave up. Look, I know we're a mess. If you've been here any amount of time, you know, I'm the start of the mess, all right? And I see you, I see you in here. Here's the truth. You would fit right in because you're a mess too. You are, we are, but we're not gonna give up. I think this is laziness. I think it's laziness. Let's love each other well. This is what I think Jesus is doing. So let me roll this all together. You can see that the discipline of Sabbath, the discipline of Sabbath that we talked about last year and the theology of Sabbath, they kind of feed off of each other. They work together, okay? You have to practice the discipline of Sabbath to really understand and get the theology of Sabbath rest. But without the theology of rest, the discipline will be in vain, right? It'll either become legalism on one side or or laziness on the other side. And it's not meant to be either of those. So church, here's the the application. I think if possible, you should be closed on Sundays. I think if your work permits it, you should be closed on Sundays. If I didn't work for the church, I'd be closed on Sundays. I'd Sabbath on Sundays. With my church, going to church, being a part of that, but I would be closed on Sundays. And listen, some of you have to work today too. Like you might be going to work later and Sundays aren't the day that you can do that. And so maybe you've got to do some other day. I do another day as well. But, but you should Sabbath, you should be closed on Sundays. And I think that coming to and serving at your church should be a part of that Sabbath routine. Gathering with God's people to hear God's word, to worship, to take the Lord's Supper, to pray, to serve the body, to love one another, to show mercy to one another. This is how we keep the Sabbath. And this is where Jesus promises that you will find rest for your soul. Not in the mountains, go to the mountains, but not in the mountains. He doesn't promise for rest there. He doesn't promise to show up on vacation. Go to the beach, enjoy it. You might encounter him there, but he promises to dwell with his people. Today, choose mercy. Today, choose love. Choose to Sabbath. Let's pray. 
Mm, Father, another sermon on the Sabbath. And yet, Lord, there's new that, that our eyes are open to in this. There's more that, that we see as we dig a little deeper into the theology of this. Sabbath isn't just, just laziness, Lord. It's not just shutting it all down and getting on the couch and watching a show or watching a game or, or avoiding people. It's, it's Lord, Lord, it's about love. Sabbathing is about loving others, being community. And Sabbath isn't about, about following all the rules and not cheating on our Sabbath routines and some sort of legalistic structure and framework that feels like it's meant to rob us and shackle us, but rather it's meant to swaddle us and, and, and hold us tight. It's meant to be an experience of your mercy and your grace. The Sabbath is made for us. It's a gift. Lord, would you help us to see this? Would you help us to learn from Jesus, from this story, and then practice Sabbath well, showing mercy and loving well. God, help us to do this. We need you, Holy Spirit, to lead us in this. So we pray these things in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit.